Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah my dear sisters and brothers and welcome to part two on the janaza. Why do we bury? You see, first before speaking about the burying, I would like to establish a difference. Realizing death in the kingdom of animals is different than grieving and all what we humans do. There is a death ritual that they follow, but this doesn't mean that they understand uh, the complexities of the loss. However, 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 animals like the elephant, the crows, the chimpanzees, the dolphins, the giraffes, and all these things have shown in fields of studies where scientists study them that these animals experience certain behaviors of, 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 of what happens when somebody dies. For example, when in, the, in, in the realm of elephant, when some elephant who is not part of that family, when they find him dead, they behave different than if one of their members of the family is injured or dead. One family, for example, was even filmed mourning a matriarch after her death. When she died, the elephant were mourning her, were pushing all these kinds of noises, and they were behaving erratically. They never behaved like that. The, the crows, when one of them dies, what they do? They gather around the dead animal and, and stay there for some time, a couple hours, because for some reason they understood that that animal is gone is no longer alive. Chimpanzees, for example, when one of their group dies, they tend to the animal. They don't leave him where he is. If it is a mother who has lost a child, it has been seen that she carries her baby with her for days until it starts rotting and getting worse, then she gets rid of him. Other than that, she keeps it. Giraffes were known to open their legs wild and go as close as possible to their baby, nugging them with their heads, nudging them, trying to move them. Uh, and it's, it really it breaks the heart to see these animals behave the way they did because they understood something about death. And that brings me to talk about the issue, why do we bury our deaths? Who has put that instinct in us to bury the dead. We could have just avoided, if someone dies, we leave him thrown wherever he is thrown, animals will eat him and we move on. Right? We could have done that, that. But since the dawn of humanity, we always have buried our deaths. Well, as it turned out, burying the dead is an instinctual, is an instinct behavior in us humans that Allah has put in us. And he explained this in Al-Quran. He says, Minha khalaqnakum. From it, i.e. the earth, we created you. Okay? Allah talked to us about how he created the first of our breed, our gender, Adam. Again, one more time, Adam is not the first human ever. He just is the new design, the new changed version of who we are today. And then, Minha khalaqnakum. From the earth, we created you, okay? وَفِيهَا نُعِيدُكُمْ And in it, into the earth, we will return. From earth we are created to the earth we are created. And then when Allah ends this world and the, this earth disappears, we will disappear with it. Our bodies will disappear with the earth. And then when Allah creates the new earth upon which the upcoming life will take place, the hereafter will take place, Allah will recreate us from the earth or the dust of that earth. وَمِنْهَا i.e. from the earth, the other earth shall be uh, uh, like this one. نُخْرِجُكُمْ تَارَةً أُخْرَ And from it we shall exit you another time. So, from this earth we have been created, back into this earth we shall be returned, and when it's the time to build another earth, so that the hereafter and the Jannah and paradise and the hellfire will be and all that kind of stuff, then Allah will create us from that. And this is in Surah Taha 20, Ayah 55. So there you are. So we know now the reason why we get buried is because Allah has put it within us. We need to go back to the mother that gave us birth, earth, and we go back to it. You see, Allah has established in the Quran 
the, the circle of life, so to speak. In few countable steps, قتل الإنسان ما أكفره. Lost to the man, woo unto man. What? This is a threat to the man. How ungrateful is he? من أي شيء خلقه. From what was man created? What, from what did he create him? Of course, we know from what. من نطفة خلقه. From a drop of semen from the man and from the woman. Yes, we call the mother, the woman, an egg, the ovule, and all that stuff. But at the end of that, the man and the woman are created from the water, the sperm of both of us. And then Allah, qaddara, Allah proportioned us. He made the the earth, uh, sorry, the the hands, the arms, and accordingly. ثم السبيل يسرا. Then Allah, He eased the way for us to come out to this life and lead our lives. ثم أماته فأقبره. Then he caused him, i.e., Allah caused man to die, and Allah ordered the burying of the man, of the human, and then on judgment day, ثم إذا شاء أنشره. And then, when Allah wants, He will again resurrect this human being. And this is in Surah Abbas, number 80, from the ayah 17 to 22. This is the process or the cycle of life. In <laughs> summarized or in a very condensed version, Allah designed us, proportioned us, caused the male and the female to join together, sex-wise, contribute with their semen. Then Allah gives life, and then we live our life according to whatever chose, uh, cho uh, choice we make, and the code is there. Once we die, we are buried, and then once we are buried, we are asleep. Our soul goes elsewhere, but our bodies goes back to, uh, go back to the earth. And then when the time comes, Allah will order our resurrection. And from here, we see that Allah ordered the burying of a human. The Arabs have come with an expression. They say, if you want to honor the dead, bury them. The burial proceedings or rituals in the Quran did Allah speak anyhow we should bury our dead well as it turned out Allah did not say how we should bury our death and left it to humans to find out whatever is good for them to deal with that big problem the calamity of death musibatul maut Allah when he created us, he knows exactly how we feel, the emotions we have, how we develop emotions, how we get attached to things, how we grieve, how, how, how. It's different. So Allah did not want to intervene and tell us how we should grieve. He gave us guidelines, but within those guidelines, we act. Just like sex. Allah did not regulate our sexual life. He did not say, do this A, B, C, D, don't do. No, he just pointed us to what we, the most important thing, the relationship must happen at vaginal level, and for the man at the penis, and not at times of height menstruation. Apart from this, entirely, you do sex in the bathroom, and on top of the roof of your car, well, of course, not in public, but Allah did not get into the details, the intricacies of sex. He told us what he doesn't want, and he left it to us. The same thing for burying our dead. Allah told us what we can and cannot do as a major point, I will mention that, and then left it to humans to deal with the next or the rest of the rituals. So what has Allah allowed in the Quran? Well, A, the burying. We must bury our dead. If the grave is six feet deep or ten feet deep, or you build a pyramid, that's entirely up to you. Allah is not there. Just Allah tells you, do not waste money in building some hefty, big, huge graves. Just be modest about it. That's fine. But how deep, how wide, how all these things is left to us. So, burying is there. And the second thing is, we make dua to the person we have buried by their graves. I'm intending to go visit my son who died Mu'ad. Uh, this week and uh, when I go there I know that my son is not in his grave uh, 
All that is in the grave is the rest of his decomposed body. Four years have gone by now. His soul is somewhere else sleeping. I will not reach it. It's sleeping. It can't hear me and I cannot communicate with him. So I'm going to the grave to visit my memories with my son because I'm still linked to my son. I love him, all these things. So when I go to the grave, I feel close to him. He's not there. But when I am at the grave site, Allah is there because Allah is with us wherever we go. So when I make dua for my son, all I'm doing is I'm asking of Allah to take care of my baby for me on judgment day. I gotta stop talking about this, bringing tears to my eyes. So all I'm doing is making dua at that moment there. And this is a thing that Allah has authorized by the graves. Allah said to Prophet Muhammad at his time when the hypocrites and the Arabs and all these kind of people were fighting secretly, fighting Al-Islam. Allah told him, when one of these people dies, لا تصلي على أحد منهم مات أبدا. Do not pray. Uh, you do not make any dua on any of them when they die ever. And this is in the last surah that Allah has revealed. So from here we understand, since Allah has forbade making dua for the deceased by their graves, we understood that at other times, Allah is very well fine with us making dua when we are at the graveside of our loved or beloved one, or even strangers. Sometimes I pass by a graveyard of English what we Muslims call the kuffar, one in fact they are not, I don't know about them, but these people are dead. I make a general dua, ya Allah, these people are sleeping here, please have mercy on them. I lose nothing, I've made dua to Allah and I am moving on. So if that is the case, if Allah has authorized two things, one, bury, two, make dua. Where do all the funeral, <laughs> the janazah that we have come from? Well, the question that about where Janaza comes from, the rituals, all, all these things, the speedy answer given to this is that if you ask any Muslim out in the streets, why we do the Janaza the way we do it? Where did we get it from? Well, the answer is simple. 99.99% .99 will tell you it's the Sunnah of the Messenger. We bury the way we bury because that is the sunnah of the messenger. The 0.1%, the left ones are going to say, I don't know, I just do it. So if that is the sunnah of the messenger, how did we know about that sunnah? Of course, they will tell us hadiths about the sunnah, some historical narratives. Oh, when this and that died, the prophet did this and that. So just in brief, yeah, when a person dies, here's what happens. The disease gets buried. Before we bury the disease, there are certain things that will happen. We wash the body and then we mix the last part of the, the water with some nice smelling deodorants, perfume, and we add it to the water. We wash the body and suddenly a dead corpse becomes perfumed and then we take a white shroud. The color must be white. I haven't until now seen a Muslim buried in the shroud that has any color different than white. And this has been going on for centuries. It's always white. And there is a psychological reason for that. And then once the corpse is covered with white shroud, we put it either in a coffin and we take it to the graveyard or like in the Arab world, they just put it on a, a, a piece of wood and they carry that specially designed piece of wood to the graveyard. Once we are there, we the rituals for the burying the, the, the body, they have some ropes and they descend the corpse down and then someone jumps inside the grave and they will angle the dead person f to face him or her, the Qibla, and then they will open the top of the face and to reveal the face and while the rest of the body is covered in that shroud thing and then they will put some slates uh, angled so that when they threw the, the 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 earth on him kind of like it doesn't crush the body and that's pretty much that and then the people go back home to dinner whatever it is but this is like the general thing 
And uh, if we ask this question, how did we learn all this? Right? And then they will tell you, oh, it's the sunnah. So when you say it's the sunnah, I would expect that the messenger of Allah was buried accordingly. Because a sunnah, he must be the first one to have taught it to people. And since people have seen how the messenger buried the dead and how they buried each other, it must be a wizened thing. That's it. The prophet is dead, then we just bury him like he did and like he taught us. However, that is not the case. One of the biggest interrogation question, mind-boggling, mind-confusing thing that happened in Islam is the burial of the Prophet himself. Yes, they never tell you about this. And we never ask. And when we ask, the Sheikh tells it to us in the most... Uh, I don't know what the term I use. It's the most hiding. He tells you something, but he hides. He hides it so well that you don't pay attention to it. In our books of fiqh jurisprudence, when they speak, or the hadith, narratives and hadith, when they talk about the matter of burying the Prophet, they always, 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 there are even hadith that starts like, اِحْتَارَ الصَّحَابَةُ فِي أَمْرِ تَغْسِيرِ النَّبِي بَعْدَ مَوْتِهِ the companions were confused about how they should wash the Prophet after his death. And perhaps the best way to have this confusion come to light is to let Aisha, the youngest of his wives, narrate to us what took place. I'm just going to go to the translation. The hadith is in, uh, in Arabic. Uh, which starts لما أرادوا غسل النبي قالوا والله ما ندري أن نجرد رسول الله من ثيابه كما نجرد موتنا أم نغسله وعليه ثيابه. The translation: When the messenger of Allah died, and the people wanted to wash his body, Aisha says, By Allah, the people said, We do not know whether we should take off the clothes of the messenger. As we take the clothes off of our dads, or should we wash him with his clothes on him? Yahi, if this is a sunnah, if this is what the messenger has taught, this must never ever have been an issue. But if it became an issue, it means the people at that time had no clue what to do, and the messenger has failed because he didn't tell them how he wanted his body to be dealt with. After his death, knowing that Allah would know how they would. But anyhow, when they disagreed with each other, they did, some of them they said, we take off his clothes. The other half said, no, 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 leave it as it is. Aisha is going to now provide us with something extremely disturbing. She said, when they disagreed with each other, Allah cast a slumber over them i.e. Allah caused them all to fall deeply in sleep. They fell asleep. Until every one of them had put his chin on his chest. What she means by this is that their sleep was so, so deep and so heavy that they could not control their heads and the heads had fallen on their chests. That's what she means. And then while they were in this state, uh, this state completely asleep, they heard a voice coming from a corner in the room. They didn't know who, who was speaking to them, but they heard very well what that voice said, and the voice said, wash the prophet while his clothes are on him. Who believes in such nonsense? If you tell me somebody had fallen so deep in sleep that he cannot control his head, and it's deep on his chest, how does this person hear a voice, much less not knowing who's talking to them? Ya Allah. We're not idiots to the extremes. I mean, they should respect at least our brains, or our intellect. Now, to us in the Muslim world, it's acceptable. You are very deep in sleep and yet you hear all the conversation and you understand it. And then she said, and then when they awoke, they washed him 
they poured water on his qamis, the qamis is the long dress the Arabs wear, and then they rubbed his body with their hands on top, i.e. they used the, the, the clothing, the dress of Rasulullah, as a uh, washing garment. Alrighty? And I wonder, Abdul Salam, I wonder why is this? Were they so dirty? Is the Prophet's flesh made up of something the humans cannot touch? Why? Are they devils or has the Prophet suddenly become an angel? Why? It's a dead corpse. The messenger is a dead corpse. Had we thrown his body to a lion, the lion would eat it, its flesh. The Quran didn't lie about this. At the end of Surah Al-Kahf, Allah says, ordered Muhammad to tell us, قُلْ إِنَّمَا أَنَا بَشَرٌ مِثْلُكُمْ Tell them, I am but a human being just like you. The Prophet of Allah, and this I find really disturbing when I talk to people of knowledge, uh, scholars, sheikhs, things like that, when I, they treat Rasulullah as, as this cosmic entity that is there, he doesn't submit to any human laws, and then to bring them to earth, I tell them, Akhi, the messenger is a human being by the text of the Quran, they say yes, I tell them he farts, and this disturb. they say, Akhi, be polite, no, I said no. I didn't say anything, I just I mentioned something that we humans do. We fart, you like it or you don't like it. And the messenger, you can rest assured, he did fart as well. He's a human being like you and me. Yes, he concealed his faults, yes, he, he was very modest, he did, yes, all that I agree with you. But at the end of the day, he peed, he pooped, he farted, he felt sick, he was joyful, he had the sexual desires, he satisfied his desire. He's a human being, what part of this we don't get? So now when he died, the, all, this, all this drama comes in, how do we watch them? He didn't leave anything. And this is very dangerous, do you know why? It's simple really, because we have other hadiths. In Bukhari and in oh the hadith about Aisha and Nam not knowing is in Abu Dawood and Ahmed ibn Ahmed is the teacher of Al Bukhari of Muslim of Abu Dawood he's a great teacher and uh, and this hadith is also authenticated by Al Albani and why this hadith doesn't make any sense simple because in another hadith by Bukhari and Muslim it is stated that Rasulullah said مَا حَقُّ مْرِئٍ مُسْلِمٍ لَهُ شَيْءٌ يُصُبِهِ فِي بَيْتِهِ لَيْلَتَيْنِ إِلَّا وَوَصِيَّتُهُ مَكْتُوبَةٌ عِنْدَهِ Abdullah ibn Umar reported that the Messenger of Allah said It is the duty of a Muslim person who has something which is to be inherited that he should go through two nights, two consecutive nights without him having his will written about it. This is in Bukhari Muslim and this is one of the things that the scholars say this is an order, an instruction from the messenger to have your will ready by your head every night before you go to bed. Alright? Rasulullah didn't leave, didn't leave anything behind him. He just died. No will. No, don't take off my clothes. Don't wash me like this. Nothing. Not a thing. The man is alive. Next day he died. And that's it. Just like any other human. And the problem with this nonsense story about they didn't know what to do is very dangerous. Because this makes the messenger of Allah somebody who preaches what he doesn't do. He says what he doesn't do. He tells me that no two nights should pass without me having a will, and he doesn't have a will. How am I going to believe this man? Allah has said in the Quran, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, O ye who have believed, Lima taquluna ma la taf'alun, Why do you say what you do not do? Kabura maqtan inda Allah, It is extremely hateful and punishable by Allah, that you say what you do not do. And this is in Surah as saf 61, the Ayah 2 and 3. Nobody in their right mind would say that the Messenger would instruct the believers not to spend two consecutive nights without them having their will by their head, while he spends his entire life without writing one will and leave it by his head. Not once, not once. This is just pure hypocrisy of a prophet. 
And of course our prophet was never ever a hypocrite. And he never ever had in him an atom weight of hypocrisy. So where do this nonsense come from? The man of religion who corrupted our Islam. I go on here on a side entertaining drama about the death of the messenger. I told you it's a headache. Our scholars of Islam do not agree on the age of Muhammad when he died. I will say it again. It is the age of the Prophet when he died is not a matter of agreement. There is a boxing match about how old was the messenger when he died. Some of them said 60, the other answer 65, and in between these two, you can go to 63, 61, 64, and so on and so forth. Today, if you ask the sheikhs and you ask anyone how old was the messenger, they will tell you, oh, 63. But the reason they're saying that is not because they are aware of the difference. It's just because the Saudis who printed the books and distributed them around the world had said 63. So most of people who say 63 are just following the Hanbali, the Wahhabi, the Salafi school of thought. Until today, there is no guarantee on how old was the messenger when he died. It's just assumptions, conjectures. Just like how many years he stayed in Mecca before going to Medina. Some of them say 13, some of them say 10. And the reason why we believe 13 is just because the Saudis who translated and printed the version of Islam we have today, they went for 13 and 10 in al Madina. Other than that, we have no idea. Now, if we dig a bit deeper into the death of the Prophet himself, we will discover without any doubt that there were and still are so many controversies about his own death and that when he died, he left no Janazah rituals to be followed after him. Even if he had buried so many people who died at his time, he didn't do it in a very specific way that people will just copy and paste. Each people were different to the other. I want to read to you something that is from the Islam QA website. And this Islam QA website, the supervisor of this website, is somebody called Muhammad Saleh al Munajjad, a Syrian immigrant who went to Saudi Arabia and became a sheikh there. He is a hardcore uh, Salafi, Wahhabi, and that kind of stuff. So he was asked a question, and this again is gonna make you go, Oh, you see, when the Prophet died, they didn't want to wash him, they didn't know what to do with him. But the other thing is, and this is disturbing, the other thing they didn't know what to do with him is how they would pray the Janazah Salat itself. You know, when we go to the Salat, we, the, the Imam will stand in front of the dead and then he will say, Allahu Akbar. And while we are standing, we do not make the ruku and we don't prostrate on the, to the ground. We just uh, pray standing. And that's it. Well, when the Prophet died, his Salat Janazah didn't take place place and this when people started knowing that they go oh ha, the prophet they didn't pray on him no they didn't pray on him as we did so the question that was asked to islam qa the, the question number is 100 154278 154278 and the date was the first of december 2010 so the question goes something like this. Why wasn't there an imam in the funeral prayer for the messenger of Allah? Why wasn't there one imam? Not Abu Bakr, no Omar, nobody led the janazah salat on the Prophet. Therefore, any salat janazah that we do, we're not doing it because it's sunnah. We're doing it because it's something else, because somebody else told us to do it. The Salafi Sheikh answers with the following. It has been and is proven through authentic narratives, hadith, that the companions performed the funeral prayer for the messenger of Allah individually. They did not pray it as a group. Individually, meaning I pray by myself, you pray by yourself, you pray by yourself, and so on. Then he said, and then he mentions here, 
the hadith narrative of a man who was present at the time of the funeral. Yeah, the funeral is something that hit the entire city. Why is it only one man who tells us about how they performed salat? It should have been every single one of them. But that's the hadith for you. An entire city doesn't hear of something and then someone tells something and that's it. It becomes part of Islam. This man was sitting in a group of people. His name Abu Asib or Abu Asim. It doesn't matter. It's a B. But it, you know. This man was sitting in front of with people and he's telling them about the, that eventful day. He said, well, I witnessed the funeral of the messenger of Allah. And then added, the companions, the people who were there, disagreed about how they should perform the Janaza prayers upon the Prophet. Some of them, they said, oh, we use the Imam, we use this, we don't. So the, they disagreed and there were arguments. And then decided to enter in his room and pray on him individually. A group of men enters and each Praise all alone. Imagine we are in a masjid. Now, end of his coat. So now, you and I enter the masjid. I, I stand there, pray by myself, and you stand there, and you pray by yourself, but we are not led in a janaza salat. And then he said, the, uh, so they would enter a bunch of them, and they would stand there, each of them prays to themselves, and they will leave from another door. So what this person is saying is that the room in which the messenger lived had two doors. They enter from one door, they pray on him, and live by the other door. This hadith narrative is authentic and reported by Ahmed, who is the teacher of Bukhari, Muslim and that, and Ibn Majah. The chain of narrators of this hadith is authentic and has been and is used by Al-Bukhari. So that is a problem. Really, it is a problem. Because from here we can see that up and until and even after the death of the messenger, the people didn't have any janaza rituals put on place to be followed. The Prophet left them without saying anything clear on this topic. Otherwise, they would never ever have disobeyed him. Aren't we told that the companions were so adamant and so invested in following the smallest acts of Sunnah of the Prophet? I'll tell you, Abdul Salam, it all was and is still a lie and a pretense. Truth of the matter is, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't put any conditions on us on how to put back whatever came from earth back to the belly of our mother earth. When it comes to death, my dear brothers and my sisters, we all are the same. We all were created from the earth and we all shall be returned to earth. Once we die, our religion, our gender, our color, our height, our weight, our social status, all of these become redundant. We all just come a piece of rotten flesh and we are good to be put inside the earth as opposed to just be left outside. Therefore, my dear sisters and my brothers, having a Muslim cemetery or cemetery or graveyard, a Jewish one, a Christian one, a Hindu one, things like that, have no basis in Islam. From the earth we were created and to it we shall be returned. If we are in a graveyard, normally speaking, once a corpse is dead, whatever he lived for, whatever he followed, becomes redundant. Today, when we Muslims bury our dead in a Muslim portion of a Christian graveyard, that is segregation. Why? What's the difference? This is a corpse and that's a corpse. Why do you still hold what is past in their lives as a element that defines who they are in their graves dead is dead once one of the differences in this human islam is that in the third century when muslims became a super empire and they were invading countries we had to have the feeling of superiority we muslims we don't get buried with anyone else just like christians felt like the jews felt and everyone else 
The element of keeping the dead segre segregated in the graveyard comes from the feeling of superiority. I am not like you, and therefore I should not bury, I should not be buried in the same place as you, knowing that both of them are human beings and end of it. I'll tell you here some differences that we Muslims have in our Janazah prayer itself. And again, I will stress this. Everything that you see in Al Janazah, except making dua, when we go to the graveyard to put the person, or the act of burying, anything else is a human invented deed. The difference is when a man dies and a Muslim woman dies and the Imam needs to perform Salat on each of them. It's, 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 it really is, is crazy. <laughs> Even in, in, in a death in Islam or the human invented Islam, there is a difference when we pray about on a man or when you pray on a woman, when you make dua for the man or we make dua for the woman. For the man, the, the, the man, the head's man is turned towards the Qibla and then the Imam comes and stands by the head of the man where the head is and the Imam performs the Salat there. If it is a woman, however, the Imam does not stand by the, her head and instead goes to her middle and performs the Salat. You can ask me why they do that. I tell you, hey, they invented Janazah prayer and rituals. Why don't they invent something else? And the reason why is because of the superiority of the male when compared to that of a female. And this is absolutely rubbish, but that's what we get when we follow humans who stick their nose in Allah's religion. The number of takbirs that we do today is usually four. However, there is a difference in schools of opinion on how many takbirs we should do. Minimum four, maximum, maximum. You can, for all your matters, have 60 takbirs for Salat Janazah and you can do that. But today, because again, they, the Saudis decided on four is a good number, we follow the four, not because Allah said it, but because the Saudis have decided it. <laughs> again, uh, the, what we should read in a Salat, some of them say we recite Al-Fatiha, Al-Fatiha is part of the Janazah. Others say, nope, it's not part of the Janazah. On the first track, I would just get into business and make dua. The other one, no, 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 no. We read the Quran on the first raka, the second raka, we do Darud Sharif, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad, ala Ali Muhammad. The other one says, no, no, no. If this is a salat to Allah, why are we bringing Muhammad into the equation? We worse than Christians. Christians, Jesus is everything to us. Muslims, the same thing. We never ever mention Allah alone. It's always Muhammad, Muhammad, Muhammad. And then they make dua to the person and then they end all this janazah uh, prayer and they go to the graveyard to bury the Muslim. So now the question that comes here is where do these rituals come from? The body wash, for example. How did we end up with it? If at the time of the messenger people were confused about it, what, what did it... Well, as I said, at the time of the messenger taking a bath was more of a chore rather than a luxury. I want you to imagine this. Yeah? At the time of the messenger, people lived in a very basic city. They didn't have a floor, they didn't have tires, they didn't have wood, they didn't have this and they didn't have that. Everything was earth. So if you pour enough water, it's going to turn into mud. People to take baths and showers had to take extremely gigantic precautions on not to turn the room where they live and sleep into a puddle of mud. So, at the time of the, 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 the messenger, the, the bricks were forming the walls and these bricks were made of uh, mud. So again, or some rocks. But so when you take a bath, you gotta make sure that you, do, you don't wet everything around you. The believers at that time also weren't living all alone. They shared Al Madina with different cultures, with Jews, with Christians, with Persians, with this, Romans, and all these kind of things. And it is far more later 
on at the time of the Abbasi dynasty, as I mentioned, when people started showing, um, people, when I say people, I mean us Muslims, our ancestors, started showing off their imperialistic dominance over the other ones. For a Muslim, because we are superpowers, when a Muslim dies, his proceedings, the way he gets buried, the way he gets taken to the graveyard, must be higher and far more elevated and far more important to that of other denominations, Jews, Christians, or other religious people who lived in the city. And in fact, in our books of fiqh and jurisprudence, we have certain rituals that when a dead person from the Jews gets dead, they are not allowed to show off the case of the dead person and they must keep quiet about burying it. This is good for the Jews, for Christians, for Persians, for anyone except Muslims. Now, I want you to imagine this. You want to establish the superiority of your religion. All right. So what they do, if anyone in the city of al Medina or Baghdad or anyone, anyone, Persians, Christian, Jew or anyone dies, his funerals are small and little. Why? Because the government forbids anything. But when a Muslim dies, oh my God, the janazah and the number of people walking behind in that funeral cortege to the graveyard. And you've got, even today, if they want to say that someone was important, they tell you, oh, and around one million people attended his funerals. So the idea of washing the body, the preparation, the janazah, all these are just to show off that Muslim's soul, once he dies, must be of something huge, just as the state was. Is this the only reason? Of course not. Absolutely not. And later on I will tell you why we wash and why we treat and why we do the body the way we do it. And it's, it's something that's going to blow your mind. Let me now take you on a journey to figure out where all these rituals come from. Because, as I said, and for sure, they are not pa a part of the divine instructed Islam and rather from the human forged Islam. And to understand that, we need to go to the closest religion that affected our Islam, and that is Judaism. As I said it before, over 80% of the Islam that the Abbasid dynasty built in the 3rd century was based on Judaism. The Jews, for example, what they do when somebody dies uh, with them, they take the body, lay it down on the floor, they cover him up with a sheet. And uh, they start the wash as tradition dictates on them. And the ceremony starts of washing the body. So the Jews will say that if it's a man, he must be washed by a man. And if it's a woman, they must be washed by a woman. The Jews then put the deceased on a wooden board or a slab. And they call that, believe it or not, a tahara board. The word tahara is exactly used in the Arabic, which means uh, purification, and has the same meaning in the Jew. So they take that body, put him on the tahara board, or the, this special board for washing the dead, and that, that face, the deceased person's face, must face the door. The door, <laughs> yes, the exit door. Already, and they put a white sheet underneath the person. If the clothes of the dead were not removed, when the corpse is being washed, of course, then the clothes are one placed on the tahara board. So if they don't remove his clothes, they would wash them with the clothes, or they wash the, uh, they remove the clothes and put them on the tahara board. They decide there and then. As the clothes are removed, a passage from the Torah is red. So the deceased is brought. If they haven't already removed his clothes, they put him on the tahara board and there they start removing the clothes of the deceased. For example, if someone had uh, died in road collision and they didn't have the time to remove their clothes, when they put him on that board, they start removing the, uh, the clothing and they read passages from the Torah. I'm not going to read the passages, but it's dua. It's uh, dua. Then they take the body and they thoroughly rub it with warm water. They keep the mouth and the nose closed so that the water does not get inside the body. 
Now the next part that the Jews do is they start pouring of water over the head. And they start, and that's why in our sunnah they tell you every time when you do your ghusl, start pouring the water on your head. And that's where it's taken from that, from Judaism, is they start pouring water over the head of the deceased body. And they read, and I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean for all your uncleanliness and from your all idols, and I will cleanse you. And this is from uh, Ezekiel 36 and their uh, verse number 25. So they read that as they pour water on the head of the deceased. And then each limb of the corpse is washed downwards, meaning when they wash your arm, they pour water from the shoulder and they wash it all the way to your hand. They don't go backward, they just do it downwards while they read passages from the Bible. If you're in interested, then go to Canticles chapter 5 and verse 11 and you find out what they read there. Finally, and this is again with the Jews, they take nine measures of cold water and they pour them over the body while it is upright standing which again it, this is the core element of the ceremony that the body gets dried and they put it in the shroud and ready to be buried you see in ancient times the hair and the nails and everything were cut but since the 19th century the hair is just combed and the, and the nails were just and that, that's that but back then they used to cut the, for Christianity you can see them it's in movies a lot when they go to the funeral house and they inject certain elements in the body so that it doesn't decompose and starts kind of like almost life like body you've seen this in movies after the body wash ceremony is finished the tahara board or the the, the wooden slab the piece of wood what they do is they wash it and they dry it, but they keep it facing the same way, uh, facing the door, because they have a belief, the Jews have this belief that turning the flab or the tahara board, turning it the other way will cause another person to die of the family, of course, to die within three days. And this is superstition. It's, it's just a piece of wood. But anyhow. So, and again, many communities have replaced the pouring of these nine measures in the Jewish community. And they don't do it anymore. But hey, that's part of who the Jews are. So, this is what happens in Judaism. Already. And most of it got taken into our Islam. So, how do the Jewish people do their funerals? Well, when a Jewish person dies, the family will follow a very well-defined protocol. That protocol helps them to send their deceased one off in the best of manner. It incorporates many rituals, and they have so many laws and customs, and all these are based, as they say, on the Torah. Like us, the Jewish is not one group of believers. They are the Orthodox, they have the conservatives, they have the reconstructionists, they try to reconstruct uh, Judaism, and they have the reformist. And to each of these groups, they have their own uh, different funerals, except sometimes they have certain things that resemble each other. So why do the Jews do what they do with their dead? Because understanding the Jewish people will help us understand ourselves. Well, as it turns out, the Jewish people believe and their faith dictates to them that one should embrace life as a whole and live it to the best, while also accepting the inevitability of death. It's inevitable. We're going to all die. Already? But unlike other faiths, Judaism does not define a specific afterlife. And this is surprising. If you speak to a Jewish person about the hereafter, you will not get one answer. And they have some real conflicting understandings and statements about the hereafter. And they believe that they will go back to Allah. But how and what and all these things are different from a Jewish to the other. 
as a whole, they believe in the immortality of the soul, that once we are born, the soul is in us, the soul doesn't die, the body, the physique does, and it's true, but for us, the soul goes and sleeps, the body gets back to earth. They believe in the world to come, judgment day, and they also believe in the resurrection of the dead, and they believe in certain elements, but that is that. So the Jews, what do? They prepare the body. When a body dies, and they... One thing about the Jews, yeah? Whatever we Muslims do, the Jewish do. Except a few changes here and things like that. That's all they do. So for them, when death occurs, the body should be left with the hands lying alongside, to the side. You don't put, you don't cross them over on the chest. Why? Because the Christian they cross the the hands on the chest as a sign of the cross to make the cross with the with the elbows and all that kind of stuff. The Jewish, like us Muslims, we leave the arms stretched to the side of the body. The jaw of the dead person should be held in the normal position and not allowed to drop. So Muslims, they take a piece of cloth and they tie the jaw to the head. The eyes of the deceased are closed, and you see this a lot in the movies. And any possible length, like the, uh, sorry, limb, must be made lengthy and tall, just like the legs and the arms and things like that. The, the, the windows in the room where the dead person is in Judaic uh, behaviors must be kept open for various reasons, for hygiene, for uh, some uh, superstition. And then they light a candle near the body. And it is customary and important in Judaism that the body is not left unattended. Someone must stay with the body all the time. And it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's interesting. Unlike what Christians and other beliefs do, a Jewish, when a person deceased, what they, they cannot embalm them, they cannot cover them uh, like the Egyptians do to preserve their death. The Jews actually do nothing. Like the Christians, they inject so many things into the body and almost you see the body like uh, he's alive. After two weeks, he's still looking the same. The Jewish people and us Muslims, we don't do that. And then the tahara gets performed on the body and the corpse was cleansed and everything, the ears, the, 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 the fingers, everything is quickly clean. It's time to take the body to the uh, graveyard. The Jews have a group of people uh, called the Chavra Kedisha. Chavra Kedisha is almost like uh, a group of people Qaddisha uh, is from the term Qaddis, holy. And uh, what they do, these people are the people who take care fully of the element of burying of the uh, Jewish uh, person. And uh, these people, they fast on the 7th of the Jewish month of Adar, which is around March. They believe because uh, that is the time when Musa died. And they fast to atone and beg forgiveness from Allah for any disrespect that they may have shown to the dead people. And then that's one of the rituals of the Jews. So a traditional Jewish funeral occurs within the first 24 hours from the dead or the death of a Jewish man. 24 hours. But today some modern ones have de delayed it a little bit just to allow the family to come and join. There is no public viewing of the body in Judaism. And the Jewish funerals can take place in a variety of different places, in their synagogue, at home, by the graveside. All these elements got taken in the third century from Judaism and injected into Allah's Islam. The Jewish people also bury their dead differently. It's either in a coffin or a piece of wood or just put the body on the ground. So the people will mourn the death and uh, the, the, the tears will be shed and people will come to the synagogue and the, the eulogy and the, the family of the, the deceased will receive all the condolences and everything. I can go in a little bit, oh, we got to the second hour, I will stop here, inshallah, and carry on on the third portion about how the Jewish practice of burying their dead got transmitted to us, the Muslims. 
Again, this is your brother Abdus Salam, and you just listened to part number two and off to part number three.